I love this paper. This is a great paper. It has so many interesting things in it. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the historical context this paper is trying to solve. Then I'm going to talk, uh, offer a few nits, not very important nits. Then I'm going to uh, uh, end by talking about some jurisprudential questions that the paper raises that I think are really interesting. Um, so uh, uh, that, what's historical context? Well, most, a lot of the historical research on the 14th Amendment has suggested that uh, in, uh, in the late 19th century, but even before, you have three ideas running around. One is police power jurisprudence. Uh, which is to say there's a police power, and if you go beyond the police power, then uh, you're in violation of the Constitution. could be the state Constitution, but after the 14th Amendment, it's the federal Constitution. Uh, there's another idea of implied limits on government, which is sometimes connected to police power, but isn't quite the same thing as police power jurisprudence. And then you have the principle against class legislation, um, which is the principle against special or partial laws. Now, lots of people who work in this area just take it for granted that all these things are features of uh, a, a pre-Civil uh, War jurisprudence in the states and post-Civil War jurisprudence in the states and the federal government. But it's been very difficult to figure out how to tie these basic principles to the actual text of the 14th Amendment. Uh, and so one of the things this paper does is create a very elegant solution for explaining these things through the concept of general law. General law being separate from federal law on the one hand and state law on the other hand. So, uh, uh, so that's the big idea. So the big idea is general law. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this story is that even without the Privileges or Immunities Clause, so even after Slaughterhouse, uh, federal courts still continued to uh, adopt these three principles. That is, uh, police power jurisprudence, implied limits on government, and class legislation, principle against class legislation, even though they were no longer using the Privileges or Immunities Clause. And this, of course, caused great confusion, right? So it leads you to ask, well, is this in any protection? Is it in due process? And the whole point of this paper is to say, well, we've just been very confused by the way history actually turned out. And instead, we should start with the Privileges or Immunities Clause and use the concept of general law, which is, it basically explains all these three features of late 19th century jurisprudence. So that's what's elegant and interesting about the paper from my perspective. And uh, now, uh, let me talk a little bit about, um, oh, and I just want to, I just want to say, if you look at a case like Loan Association versus Topeka, which you guys mentioned, you see that in diversity cases on appeal to the Supreme Court, that what happened is they would just apply what you would call general law. They would just do it. And they didn't think twice about it. And even cases where Justice Miller writes the opinion, the author of Slaughterhouse, they still do it. So what you have is these features of jurisprudence, and you have to explain them. Why does Justice Miller decide Slaughterhouse the way he does, but then engage in general law style of reasoning in Loan Association versus Topeka? That's, what this, that's the historical context in which it's occurring. OK, here's a very minor nit. This is really minor. Uh, for those of us who have been writing about the history of the 14th Amendment, Kurt Lash, myself, uh, and other folks, it is, there's always been this problem, which is, is it possible, uh, well, I call it the problem of can the Privileges or Immunities Clause walk and chew gum at the same time? That is, can it perform multiple functions, or can, does it only perform one function? So I am of the school that believes that it can walk and chew gum at the same time, which means that in my view, from the standpoint of your paper, it, it protects general law, but it also protects uh, federal rights. That is, those rights which are distinctly federal, and which uh, and and therefore I have a view of incorporation slightly different than the papers. So one way of understanding this is there are rights in the uh, in the Constitution which may not, in fact, uh, line up perfectly with the general law equivalents. So it may, and if you think about the debates over the Bill of Rights, you see that, in fact, they change the language here or there, they do different things. So it's possible there might be some gap between what the general law required and what the federal rights in the Bill of Rights were. And also there are the rights like the Third Amendment. It's not clear to me that the Third Amendment uh, comes from general law. Uh, maybe it does. But that would suggest that it's a special kind of federal right. Uh, and so, in my view, you have to understand the Privileged Immunities Clause simultaneously protecting federal rights against states, which is not the position of this paper, but also general law rights, which is the position of this paper. That's a very minor nit, and there are ways of getting around the problem that's actually in the paper itself. I'll let you guys respond to that. So <laughs> let's um, uh, talk about the more general problem, the more general jurisprudential problem in the paper. And the best way to... Uh, explain it is the, the old saw that the past is a different country. 
and uh, we don't live there, uh, and, and people live there thought in very, very different ways than we do today. Uh, the problem is that if you're going to do an originalist paper, that is a paper uh, making a claim about how the Constitution should be uh, interpreted today, as opposed to a purely historical paper, that is a paper explaining how did people in the past think, and isn't it interesting that they thought so differently than we do today, then you're going to face a particular problem, which is how do you operationalize a set of legal concepts and ideas which, in fact, were taken as entirely commonsensical in the period you're studying, but today seem strange and alien and you don't know how to use them. Uh, and in this case, it's the concept of the general law. The, the general law was always a fuzzy and ill-formed concept, even in the 19th century, just like the, the idea of class legislation was a fuzzy and ill-formed concept in the 19th century. But people thought, well, we can make it work. Uh, just as there are concepts today that we think are fuzzy, but we think we can make them work. So that's kind of how they thought about the problem in those days. But we don't live in that world anymore. We don't live in a world where lawyers are trained to think in terms of the idea of a general law that is neither the law of the states nor the law of the federal government, uh, but that the states approximate through their positive enactments. We think of this as, well, we, I'm, I'm not these guys, but we <laughs> think of this as, as kind of uh, the brooding omnipresence in the sky, right? Or, you know, mumbo jumbo or something like that. So, and that's because America moved into what I call constitutional modernity. Uh, and a characteristic feature of constitutional modernity is realism, is American legal realism, which is in fact one of America's great contributions to jurisprudence. Uh, and from the standpoint of a, of, a, of a world after realism, general law, well, that's what they thought then, but, well, I don't know, what, what are we going to make head or tail of it? So how are we going to do it? And this is a problem not for a historian, but for an originalist, because originalism treats law of the past as something which lawyers today can read and understand and use, just like law from 1960 or law from 2008. Law from 1868 is law, and lawyers are trained to read the law and understand the law. The law is legible to them. That's, I guess, the way I would put it. So the problem for the originalist is if people don't think this way anymore, if they don't reason in this way and they think the basic concepts make no sense to them, how is the law legible to them? So what that means is that the project this paper is announcing, not as an historical project, but as an originalist project, is to come up with proxies, that is, ways for people who have already drunk from the, the well of realism to use concepts which people don't believe in anymore. And I'm not here to say that can't be done. I'm simply here to say that it is more complicated than simply doing the lawyer's task of reading the statutes and texts and reading the meaning of them off. There's a, an imaginative work that has to be done to translate a world nobody believes in into this world. Actually, I say they believe in it. I mean, this, I was just talking to uh, uh, Steve before. Steve wants to overturn Erie, right? And I was just saying that I would dub him a post-realist. Just like, you know, uh, Adrian Vermeule is a post-liberal, so I would say that Steve is a, is a post-realist. He says, I think that realism took a wrong turn. I'd like to change some things. But it's not like you can go back to the world before realism, because you can't. You can only go forward. And therefore, that his task is a post-realist task, which is to recreate the uh, equivalence, right, for purposes of doing originalism uh, that, that our legal culture doesn't believe. At one point, um, uh, I mean, this is also very interesting, too. If you, uh, I want to put Judd aside from uh, uh, Will and uh, Steve for one reason. Uh, Judd's work has largely been about the past as a foreign country. And uh, Will and Steve's, uh, yeah, Will and Steve's work has not been about that. It's really been about making originalism work, making the law work. And their model has been positivism. Their model has been basically the idea that uh, it's the founder's law as lawfully changed. And so they based their theory of originalism on positivism. The problem is this new paper has a problem. And the problem is this paper is not positivist. That is, it is a particular kind. You can make it positivist, but it's not positivist in any way that anyone in the 20th century would think is positivism. General law is opposed to positivism. General law thinks of positivism as not, not, not a thing. Uh, and certainly, it's certainly true of the current legal culture. It doesn't think positive, uh, positivism doesn't think general law is a thing. Now, what you can say is whatever legal officials thought at a particular moment in time, 
That's the law, and that would be positivism, right? But the problem is, they're positivists today, not just positivists in the 19th century. And so they face a tension between their account of original law, originalism, and, and, positive, and their account of positivism, because they also believe that there have been no significant breaks in how lawyers understand law. But here is a break, and it's a big one. It's a doozy. It's the break of all breaks, and it's characterized the change between the pre-modern and the modern world. At one point, they say, well, maybe judges aren't permitted lawfully to change such a big thing, but my view is, like baptism, I not only believe in it, I've seen it done. And so this creates a really interesting jurisprudential challenge uh, not for you, Judd, but for uh, <laughs> Will and Steve. I'm not saying the challenge can't be met. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that it raises a whole bunch of really interesting theoretical issues that will be the subject of future work. Thank you. Yeah, obviously, you know, maintaining three uh, people together on a paper who have a lot of different assumptions is a project. I'll just map out. There are three obvious directions this paper can go, and the paper does not take a view on it because I think the three of us may not even have, uh, may not have a consensus view among ourselves. Right, so one possibility is uh, the general law is dead and the 14th Amendment is dead too. Like this paper could be a story. You could write a second paper about how this paper explains why the project of the 14th Amendment failed in a way. That it relied upon an assumption about how legal culture worked that the realists destroyed uh, and the realists in the process destroyed the 14th Amendment and that's too bad. That's actually a very plausible story. That might be true. Uh, or it's possible the general law lives or if it's not currently alive, it can be resurrected. Uh, through the overruling of Erie and further work, in which case we just got to keep on trucking, right? Like, we'll get there. <laughs> uh, the general the general law will come back. Or something in between, like that we can invent something that will do for the 14th Amendment what general law used to do, uh, sort of uh, sci prey, uh, if you will, like it's as close as possible, which could be many different doctrinal options for how you could get there, knowing that what the thing was originally supposed to be the general law. Like, all those are possible paths. All those deserve their own paper. We will present them in future years. So, uh, I, I might uh, jump in very quickly just to say, um, I don't think that general law and positivism have any conflict between them whatsoever. What's, what's positivist uh, in our approach is we want to know what the law is now. Right now, people say that the law is the law of the founding in lots of ways, and we you know, talk about the how to understand them and at what level uh, of uh, commitment one should be looking for that. But to the extent that we're right at all about originalism as a positive case, the way in which people cross-refer to the law of the founding is not one that I think would be vulnerable to this kind of response. Um, if people are widely confused about the general law, that would be sort of like people being widely confused about the meaning of the Sixth Amendment. I don't think that necessarily causes the wide confusion about the meaning of the Sixth Amendment to become the law if they uh, subscribe to to uh, presuppositions that would explain why it's a confused view. Uh, we talk in some prior work about sort of higher order and lower order commitments. If people have a higher order commitment to using the law of the founding in some way, the fact that they think the law of the founding is X is something they could be wrong about and that does not uh, make X the law as, uh, as a positive matter. But if you're interested, I refer you to my papers on finding law and uh, to, on the Constitution in Exile. And Will and I have a new paper uh, coming out on the official story in Oxford Journal of Legal Studies available at fine bookstores near you. <laughs>